We're just taking a moment here to gather. Um, and so I'll ask everyone to take their seats, please. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today online and in person. I'm so delighted to have the opportunity today to introduce our C. Miller Fisher visiting professor today, Dr. Louise McCullough. Um, I'm Dr. Schwamm, if, uh, if you don't know me, and uh, it is uh, such a pleasure for me to do what I consider a, something of an impossible task, because on the one hand, I want to spend a few minutes just recognizing the extraordinary accomplishments of Dr. McCullough. She's an incredible physician leader. She is a really uh, renowned scientist. She's the chair of a department and a, a really tremendous mentor. Um, and a supporter of young faculty members and women in medicine. But I wouldn't do justice to the other side of her that I know quite well, which is her warm personal style. Uh, she is both the, I, I think she's a quadruple threat. She's the researcher, the clinician, the leader, and she's someone you'd want to go to a bar with on Saturday night. <laughs> so uh, I will let you look at her, uh, at her CV, which is included in the pamphlet was attached to today's uh, meeting notice to see all of her various awards and accomplishments, but I want to leave the time for her to be able to give us this wonderful lecture. And so before we begin, Louise, I'm going to present you with this plaque in recognition of being the 2022 Singular Fisher Business Professor. We're going to step over here for a minute. Oh, picture. thank you. Hello. Okay, hopefully you guys can hear me online. Thank you, Lee. And I'm glad you didn't take a long time with the introduction because you know I tend to talk really fast and try and cram too much stuff into a talk. Um, but I'm a very casual speaker, so if anybody wants to interrupt me and ask a question, feel free. Okay. Um, I'm very honored to be one of the first to come back to a, a live presentation, which is interestingly hybrid. I'm live and the audience is remote. <clears throat> but thank you for those of you that could come today. All right. It is recording. Oh, okay. Because I don't talk loud enough. The people here can't really hear you. How's that? Good? All right, let me see if I can advance these slides. Okay, I couldn't start without thanking you for inviting me and honoring C. Miller Fisher. Um, I went on CMF grounds yesterday. It was excellent. A uh, great group of uh, attendees and residents. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Fisher was originally from Canada, I went to medical school in Toronto. And I didn't know this. He actually served and was a prisoner of war in Germany during World War II. After World War II, he went to the prestigious uh, Montreal Neurological Institute, the MNI, where he was mentored by Penfield. He then did a neuropathology fellowship with Ray Adams at Boston City Hospital. And there's also a Ray Adams service here. So a lot of history here at Mass General. He used the first, he was the first to use the term TIA, which is actually a term that is in evolution for us with imaging. Um, and a half century at Mass General, which is so impressive. He started the first designated stroke service, but what's really amazing about him is he was beyond smoke, uh, stroke. He talked about lacunar infarcts, subarachnoid, vasospasm, Guillain-Barre, and NPH, transient global amnesia. I mean, he had such a huge impact on neurology, and he published until he was 96, and probably not much to the resident satisfaction, which we couldn't get away with anymore. He used to round from 6 to 11 p.m. So this talk is going to be a blended talk. I'm going to start a little bit, and some of you guys heard this yesterday. My fundamental interest is in sex differences in stroke and in sex differences in cognition and other diseases. Um, so I'll start with a little bit about sex differences in stroke, and then I'm going to move on, because some of you heard a little bit about this yesterday, into the microbiome and aging, because I think they're super important. So first of all, are there sex differences in stroke subtypes? 
Clearly there are. We haven't studied intracerebral hemorrhage that much and ICH, typically hypertensive ICHs, don't seem to have much of a sex difference. In fact, men may be more affected because of prevalence of hypertension. But if you look at low R ICHs and cerebral amyloid, there may be a female predominance and that data is kind of mixed. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is clearly a sex-specific disease. About 60 to 65% of aneurysmal subarachnoids are in females around perimenopause. But today we're gonna to talk more about ischemic stroke because it's the most prevalent type of stroke and it's the one I model in the laboratory. So just as a brief overview about the epidemiology of stroke, um, men are actually more affected during most of the lifetime. But one in five women will have a stroke in her lifetime versus one in six men. And that's a lot to do with women living longer. So women live longer. The average age of the first stroke in women is 72, and for a man is 67. Those five years matter, though. The women accrue a lot of disability and comorbidities, so they're often uh, more disabled when they first come in with their stroke. In most age groups, stroke is more prevalent in men than in women. There's a little asterisk there to remind you there's a couple times in the lifespan that women are extremely high risk for stroke. One is postpartum, and there seems to be an increasing rate of stroke in midlife, 35 to 45. That population is really increasing in their stroke incidence. It may be related to obesity, diabetes, but certainly pregnancy itself is a, and postpartum is a very high risk period for women. In fact, their stroke rates can be as high as when they're 70. Um, so whenever you get a call to see a postpartum or a pregnant woman with a you know, headache, be very cautious. Um, as children in a hormone-free environment, boys do much wor worse than girls. So if you have a kiddo with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, boys have more damage and more neurological um, consequences. And we don't really know why that is. Uh, most of this is in a hormone-free environment, so there's probably some chromosomal sex differences, XX versus XY, where there's either protective genes on the X chromosome or detrimental genes on the Y. And we all learned in med school that, oh, we, de we inactivate that X, so it's a bar body, it doesn't do anything. 20% of genes on the second X chromosome are transcribed and translated throughout the lifespan, and that's high in the brain. And it depends which X chromosome is expressing the genes. And there's a thing called X chromosome inactivation, which gets leaky with age. And we think estrogen represses inflammatory genes. And then postmenopause, some of those genes are derepressed. That's a long, you know, complicated story where we use mouse models where we can make XX males and XY females, but I won't go into it today because it's a little too complicated. But we know that things change with age and there's complex interactions with aging hormones and chromosomal sex, XXXY. But knowing there's this effect of aging, the data is very clear that more women die after their strokes, they're more disabled after their strokes and require SNF placement in over 30% in a skilled nursing facility. But a lot of those women are widowed and live alone. So even if you have a mild stroke and you can't get up three steps into your apartment, you're not going to be able to go home. There's also higher rates of secondary stroke, depression, and post-stroke cognitive decline in women. But you have to take this in the big picture. So these are this is a meta-analysis, and this has been, been shown multiple times now. If you look at unadjusted factors, women have a 35% more likely to die than men one year after their stroke. But if you adjust that, it fully reverses. So what are these adjustment factors? Some's age, it's also depression, living status, and comorbidities. Um, so if you control for those, women actually have a survival advantage but it is what it is, more women die after stroke. So women are also still very underrepresented in clinical trials. And um, this has been shown throughout the literature, cardiac disease, stroke, but you can see for all of these diseases, except for pulmonary hypertension, which is much more female predominant, women are under-enrolled in clinical trials. And this is what I talked about yesterday, the difference between sex and gender in um, panel B women are much more likely to go for a lifestyle than an intervention trial. So sex is biological, XX, XY, hormones. Gender is how you perceive yourself as male, female, kind of societal concepts of, of female, male. 
And this may be a gender effect that women are less risk averse. So perhaps they're not going into the intervention trial, but I think there's so many factors to this. Um, it may be that women are not approached for the trial. It may be that they don't have anyone um, at home to sign for them. Um, they may not have ability to speak if they have aphasia. So there's probably a lot of factors, but what's a very interesting statistic is if the PI of the trial is female, they enroll more females. So there's probably a lot of different things going on here. So is it important to even look at both sexes? So women are underrepresented. And just as a quick aside, if we use the thrombectomy um, criteria of uh, having an MRS below two, and uh, age less than 80, you would exclude 40% of women. So many women, and this is very important when you're looking at outcomes from clinical trials. If somebody comes in and they're using a walker, they have a modified ranking score of three. They need help walking, right? Um, they get an intervention. Six months later, their modified ranking is three. Well, that's awesome. That's a great uh, result. They went back to their pre-stroke baseline. But if you don't take into account their pre-stroke baseline, she'll look like a three. And that is not a good outcome. So you have to be very careful about accounting for these pre-stroke disabilities. You don't want to throw out an effective therapy that worked because, and I really think we need to start looking at Delta MRS or change MRS or back to baseline MRS because those are good outcomes. Um, so it doesn't matter to look at both sexes and doesn't matter in the lab. This is just, I'm not gonna go into great details about this study, but this is a study we did looking at tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 receptor antagonist. You can't block IL-6. Everybody knows IL-6 is linked to stroke severity. Um, and it seems to be the same in men and women. When we look at IL-6 levels, it's more tied to NIH stroke scale and stroke size than uh, uh, sex. But we looked at this tocilizumab. And as you can see here, 72 hours after stroke, this is males. So here is the IgG control and here's the drug. So significant benefit of blocking IL-6 receptor in males. And that included um, no, uh, a reduction in post-stroke brain atrophy. So the males that got this drug did much better and they had better behavioral outcomes. And this was true in both young and aged males. But when we looked at females, um, we did not find any benefit long-term after ischemia. So what we started to look at, and this is the value of doing back translation in biobanks, is we looked at the mouse IL-6 receptor levels because we're blocking the receptor. You know, we said, well, maybe we're not blocking it as well. And as you can see here in the mouse, um, here's a sham, uh, sham animals, males and females, and their levels were pretty low. After stroke, 24 hours after stroke, you can see that females have much more IL-6 receptor. We're trying to figure out why that is. It seems to be due to caspases and cleavage of the receptor. And then we went back to our biobank and the same exact thing happens. So here's um, uh, patients without stroke and here's patients 24 hours after stroke. And as you can see, the same thing, IL-6 receptor levels were much higher in women. So we went back and redid our studies and aged males and females. And we found here um, with the low dose, males benefited. There was really no benefit of increasing the dose, but in females, you could see there was no benefit at the 20 milligram per kilogram dose, but there was a huge benefit at hundred milligrams. So we weren't blocking receptor signaling in females. This is important. If we're gonna take tocilizumab into a clinical trial for MCA patients, then we really need to probably do ELISA's to make sure that we're actually blocking the receptor because um, otherwise it's not gonna have an effect. And if you pool and do not sex disaggregate the data, you could throw out a potential neuroprotective agent um, that, and certainly one could use a neuroprotective agent in one sex and not in the other. So this is important and it's important also for clinical trials. This is the SPRINT trial that changed our guidelines about intensive blood pressure lowering. We know lower blood pressure is uh, linked to lower stroke risk, lower cardiovascular disease. But if you look carefully at the SPRINT trial in New England Journal of Medicine, look here. So first of all, the boxes are the numbers of patients enrolled. So many more men were enrolled. This is zero, the confidence interval is zero. So clearly there was a dramatic benefit of lowering intensive blood pressure control in men. There was also a trend in women, but it's a trend. It crosses, the confidence interval crosses one. 
likely because the study was underpowered for women. So what do we do about this? Should we, if you sex disaggregate data, there's no doubt blood pressure control is good for women too, but it would be nice to know that. So doing a tactic, adaptive trial design, what they should have done perhaps is continue to enroll women until the number got larger so you could see actual statistical significance. And then there's, this um, is also true in other clinical trials. This is the Paragon heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and more females are affected by this. So they had very good balance male and female enrollment. And as you can see here, adding a, this drug to men did absolutely nothing, but it was significantly beneficial in women. So if you had not sex disaggregated this data, you would have probably thrown this out, but this is clearly a beneficial therapy for women. And it works both ways for both women and men. You'd be giving men another drug with side effects that has no benefit. So it's really important to think about sex in our clinical trial design, as well as our analysis. So I study stroke in the lab and I, you know, give little middle cerebral strokes with a suture. I'll show you in a minute. A young, happy 12 week old animals. All right, a 12 week old C57 mouse is like a teenager. We've seen a lot of teenage stroke. No, we see teenage stroke, but it's different mechanisms than the classic stroke that we see in older people. So it made us take a step back and say, you know, why are we not able to translate things? Does it matter the model that we're using? I mean, caveats of all the mice mirroring work and animal work, but we need to get a little bit closer to the disease that we're trying to model. So here's um, a 32 year old mice chunky brain, you know, good, no atrophy, no white matter. And then this is one of my patients who's 78. This patient actually has cerebral amyloid, but you can see how much atrophy and white matter there is. Look at, so small. So does the stroke affect this person and this person differently? So age is the most important non-modifiable risk factor for stroke, but maybe it's modifiable. We'll talk about that in a minute. Inflammation plays a key role in stroke pathophysiology and recovery. By 2050, the age population will reach almost 90 million. Um, we are an aging society. Some people have called it the gray tsunami is coming. So it is associated with persistent low levels of circulating markers of inflammation, and that's been coined inflammaging. So as we age, our baseline CRP, IL-6, TNF-alpha, all increase, but that may be an adaptive response to all the environmental and toxic stressors that, and, and keep us alive. Um, but we know that inflammation and inflammation can accelerate dementia. So we first started, this is now going back like 10 years now, um, modeling stroke in aged animals, so 18 months, which is about equivalent to a 70, 75 year old. Um, and what we found, it was very paradoxical and people still, you know, so many people have replicated this, um, this is a young male. This is a coronal section of a TTC stained uh, brain. TTC is picked up by viable mitochondria and is turned pink. So this is the area of infarct here. And it's a big infarct with a lot of edema. See what happens in the aged male? They actually have a smaller histological stroke. And so we went on, is it suture size? Is it LDF? Is it this? No, same degree of ischemia. Older animals have smaller strokes, especially in males, and they have a lot less edema. We're trying to figure out why this is. But clearly the aged animals, 50% of them when we first started were dying by day three. We've spent the past five years refining this technique so we can now get 80% survival even a month after stroke. It requires a lot of animal husbandry. We've learned a lot. If anybody's interested, just email me and I can send you the protocols. But you can see, despite this massive infarct, these animals recovered and did really well. When you look at young stroke, looking at the neurological deficit score, the young animals, despite this large infarct, were scampering around the cage, whereas the age ones had much more significant disability and died. So we first started thinking, well, is this due to peripheral inflammation? So this is a flow plot. For those of you that are not used to looking at flow cytometry, this is CD11B. And as you go up this axis, CD11B increases in intensity. And this is CD45. 
This gate right here is CD11 intermediate, because it's intermediate, and CD45 low. This gate is traditionally the microglial gate. There's a lot of caveats to that. We've done lineage tracing and we won't get into it, but if any of you are interested in kind of the phenotyping of microglia, we can talk about that. But this microglia gate is considered CD11, um, the intermediate. And then these cells here are peripheral leukocytes. They're CD45 high. So CD45 high cells are peripheral immune cells. And you can see even in the uninjured brain, we used to think the brain was an immune privileged site. We all know that's not true. Leukocytes can traffic in and out of the brain, even in uninjured brain and in young brain. And some of these are T cells, very important in memory, um, but there's not a lot of peripheral cells. Now look at what happens with stroke. The microglial gate goes down because microglia are just like every other cell in the brain and just as vulnerable to ischemia. Some of these microglia we now know here jump gates and can express CD45 high. So that's a caveat. But you see all these massive infiltration of peripheral leukocytes from either the blood or perhaps the bone uh, skull, bone marrow. But in HGM, you see these microglia, they have much more peripheral infiltration at baseline. And we think this is because over life, the brain antigens are exposed to the periphery. So there's more, uh, more resident um, cells, peripheral cells in the age brain. But after stroke, you still see this infiltration. But what's very important is in young, the main cell that comes in is a monocyte. In aged, there's a dramatic increase in neutrophils. So there's a much more neutrophilic response in aged animals. So what are these neutrophils doing? We know neutrophils secrete ROS and they secrete MMPs that can degrade blood brain barrier and lead to hemorrhage. We all know that TPA associated hemorrhages are associated with age. So what we did is we were trying to figure out was it the brain compartment or the peripheral immune compartment? So what we did is make heterochronic bone marrow transplants. So that's where you take old bone marrow and put it into an irradiated young mouse and take young bone marrow and put it into an irradiated um, aged mouse. Therefore, the peripheral immune system is either aged or young. So the host may be aged or young, but their peripheral immune system is manipulated. So this animal here is an old animal with old bone marrow. And you can see there's a lot of hemorrhage. If we take an old animal and give them young bone marrow, we abrogated that hemorrhage phenotype. So simply replacing the peripheral immune system with a young immune system stopped these aged animals from bleeding. And you can see here, these, all this hemorrhage, particular hemorrhage, um, and it's probably driven by the bone marrow, by the neutrophils. Because here, if you replace it with a young marrow, you no longer get the hemorrhage. So these aged neutrophils are bad. And the young animals also started to have hemorrhage, which we don't usually see in our model. Young animals, despite that really large infarct, don't hemorrhage. And so here we started looking specifically at the neutrophils. And here's the young animal, and this is a crustal violet stain. And here you can see the larger infarct compared to the smaller infarct. But what we found is a very strong um, relationship between these neutrophils and um, bleeding and neurological deficit. So here is the MMP um, secretion by these neutrophils. This is young, this is age. So you can see the age neutrophils secreted a lot more MMPs, which we know are related to bleeding. So then we went back to brain samples of uh, stroke patients and looked at age versus young stroke patients on autopsy. And what you can see is here, um, this is a sham control, this is ischemic stroke. You can see many more neutrophils in the brain parenchyma. These are labeled by MPO and they secreted a lot of MMP9 and they clustered around areas of hemorrhage. So here you can see the MPO expression much higher in the aged ischemic stroke than in a young ischemic stroke. And that was related to hemorrhage and very strongly correlated with age. So then we go back to the lab. Okay, well, people have tried blocking neutrophils before and it hasn't done anything. They never actually blocked neutrophils specifically. They tried IPM, VPM antibodies, but not neutrophils. So we took a Lysix-G antibody and depleted the neutrophils before um, stroke. And there was a major benefit to 
blocking those neutrophils. They had much better adhesive um, removal tests, much better outcomes, but this had no effect in young mice. So blocking neutrophils didn't do anything for young mice and it dramatically improved outcome in age mice. So that tells us we should probably be looking at age mice. Now, I'm gonna to totally shift gears because I know some of you guys are interested. So that's the aging part. So we'll get back to aging. But this, we're gonna talk now about the um, uh, gut-brain axis, the microbiome gut-brain axis. It's a very important regulator of neuroinflammation in both aging and stroke. And it's really coming under a lot of um, interest so we know that there's gut-brain interactions. They may be related to vagal nerve stimulation. They may be related to cytokine release, um, but we know there's also an interaction between the brain immune um, cells and the gut immunity is very important. The gut is the largest immune system uh, organ that we actually have. We think about spleen and um, bone marrow, but the gut is very important. It has very important um, T cell subtypes, gamma delta T cells, um, which are a little bit inflammatory and those change with age. So there's a review about this that just came out in uh, CERC research. Um, if any of you are interested in kind of getting more um, uh, background about the gut brain axis. So let's see what happens to the gut after stroke. Oh yeah, so I wanted to remind you about inflammation. This is very important about that increase in low grade systemic inflammation. Can we reverse that? And what are the possible sources of this inflammation? Could some of them be peripherally derived? Yes, because these are serum markers. So what's causing that inflammation? Okay. So the gut my microbiome is a long neglected immune organ. It's very important for host immunity. Um, it's DNA similarity is greater than 99%. Um, Inter-individual variability of the microbiome, which is the bacteria that colonize our gut. There's also microbiome in the skin and the mouth. We're going to talk mostly about the gut today because that is the highest burden of bacteria. Many factors affect the biome. Diet, and this is why it's so difficult to study in patients. If somebody took an antibiotic a month ago, their biome is going to differ. If they took steroids a month ago, their biome is going to differ. Even people living in the same house, eating the same diet, have different microbiomes. So there's some host-derived factors that influence which biome can attach to the host. Um, but more importantly, we had started looking at the microbiome and the composition of the bacteria. I think it's less important what bacteria are in there. What's more important is what those bacteria produce. And that's called the metabolism. And that's what the bacteria produce. And many of the host metabolites, the host can't make them. They were completely rely on the biome to make these metabolites. So just a few methods to study the gut biome. You can use 16S RNA sequencing, which is sometimes called microbiome sequencing. It's can pick up a few non-bacterial, but it's really a bacterial sequencing. Um, metabolomics analysis, we use mass spec, and that's to get those metabolites. Um, you can use germ-free mice, um, which we have used, which have no biome. They're raised um, completely sterile. They have all kinds of weird behavioral things. They're microglia or immature. Their gut doesn't work right. Their autonomic system doesn't work right but they can be a useful tool for transplantation studies. And then we use a lot of microbiota transplant models, which is basically a fecal transfer. So you can take a fecal slurry for, from a young mouse, give antibiotics, you really need the antibiotics to get rid of the host biome and reconstitute a youthful biome in an aged animal. So we do that and maybe we can use these clinically and we do use microbiota transfers for things like refractory C. diff. The problem, and I'll explain why we did some of our experiments, the problem with giving a biome transplant is you're not just giving them bacteria. You may be giving viruses, you may be giving yeast. So, you know, if we can refine that therapy, um, but clearly it works in uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, refractory C. diff. So let's look at our stroke model. I told you that those aged animals were just dying. So we're like, why are these aged animals dying despite having this smaller stroke? It's not edema, it's not herniation. So we looked and saw that their body temperature, the aged animals had a significant drop in body temperature. They lost a lot of weight at 72 hours and they did not regain it by seven days. The hypothermic response made us think, well, maybe they're getting septic. So not surprisingly, right? 
But if you look, you can see these are young animals, and this is IL-6, right? This is a sham, and you can see with stroke, there's a dramatic increase in IL-6 in young animals. But by 24 hours, the animal has controlled that. But if you look at the aged animals, they have a high level of IL-6, and that is persistent out even to a week. Um, and then you can look at the lymphocyte myeloid ratio, which is a marker of immune suppression. And you can see that aged animals have much more significant post-stroke uh, immune suppression, which of course puts them at risk for infections. And we know one of the biggest drivers of post-stroke infections is age. So what we started to say, okay, well, they're septic. Okay, and we came across the microbiome completely not looking at the biome. We were trying to figure out why our aged animals were dying. So we took um, uh, various tissues and um, homogenized them and plated them out. This happens to be a blood auger. You can use other augers to um, uh, you know, get the uh, more gut derived. So here's the age stroke. Uh, these are the mesenteric lymph nodes. These happen to drain the gut. And you see all these little white spots those are bacterial colony forming units. So you can see in an aged animal versus a young animal, there's many more of these bacterial colonies in the mesenteric lymph nodes, suggesting that there is more you know, uh, bacterial burden in the blood. Um, and you can see here the quantification of that. So what we did then is we took these little colonies and we sent them for 16S sequencing to see what they were. And we found not only the amount, but the composition of the systemic bacteria differ in young and aged mice. Aged mice had many more gram negatives, very uh, non-commensal organisms. We're like, why is this? Are, are gram negatives or more pathogenic bacteria getting out easier in age? Is it a gut thing? And it turned, so we started to look at the gut. So this is what happens. Stroke is no longer considered a brain disease. It is a systemic disease. We've known this for some time. Um, Keith Pennypacker was the first to describe spleen involution after stroke. Um, and so the lymphoid organs change dramatically with that sterile injury. And these are the gut changes that we see after stroke. This is a gut histology. This red arrow is pointing to the mucus barrier. This is the lumen where all those bacteria are. And you can see this is a very important barrier separating bacteria from host. And you can see with aging, this is a sham aging, you see you lose that mucus barrier. And you can also see a lot of inflammation in the lamina propria and loss of uh, goblet cells, which produce the mucus. And this is what happens after stroke. It's destroyed. There is no longer a mucus barrier, okay? And the same other uh, way we protect ourselves from our bacteria is there's a little hypoxic barrier here, which also makes the bacteria more difficult to translocate into this host epithelium. And again, completely lost. So all those barrier functions that we use to protect ourselves um, are disturbed with uh, stroke and with aging. So here we know that aging exacerbates that gut phenotype. So here's an example. This red here is a fish stain. This stains bacteria. This black area is the mucus barrier and the blue is the host epithelium. And you see what happens in sham. There's nice mucus barrier, very nice separation between the bacteria and the host. Look at what happens after stroke. You can actually track these bacteria and we're now labeling them and using uh, cranial windows to see if they get into the brain. You can see these bacteria just crawling into the host. We know that aged, um, aged animals have much higher gut permeability and that probably correlates with increased colony forming unit. So then we looked at the differences in the aged biome. We're like, okay, well, there's more pathogenic bacteria, they're seeding, they're translocating, the gut's all messed up. But is the bacteria different in a young and an aged animal? And the answer is yes. Here's the PCA plot. Here's a young biome. Here's an aged biome. There's almost no overlap. And this is kind of a crude way to look at the biome. I'm not going to show bazillions of bacterial plots because they'll make your head hurt. So this is a young microbiome. This is an old microbiome. A young 
uh, microbiome has many more of these bacteroidea species, which are thought to be commensal and beneficial, and fewer of these firmicutes that are thought to be angrier and um, uh, can really activate host immunity. So just looking at young biome and age biome from fecal samples, you can see the shift in the F to B ratio. So some people will talk about the F to B ratio. So the F to B ratio is very low, which is good in young. In age, you see many more of those pathogenic firmicutes. So we then said, okay, well, can we transfer the biome? Can we take a young donor and recapitulate a young biome in an aged host? And the answer is yes. And then you can do it a month before stroke. And this was one of our first studies. We did this a month before stroke because we wanted to avoid the effects of antibiotics. And we were able to take a young donor and restore that F to B ratio in an aged recipient. We also did the reverse where we gave aged biome to a young recipient and we recapitulated the aged biome in young. So giving aged microbiome to young animals was really bad. We do not see much mortality in our stroke model in young animals. When we gave them a month before stroke an aged biome, half of them died. And I think it's even worse because they're not, um, they haven't got that inflammation phenotype. They haven't learned how to deal with these toxins. So they just died. In contrast, the aged animals that got young biome did much better. So, but you can say, well, that's great, Louise, but how translational is that? We're gonna change everybody's biome before stroke. So we started to say, well, can we change it after stroke and still get a benefit? So these are all aged mice, okay? So the study design is like this. So here's aged mice. They're 18 to 20 month old, which is pretty old. They were either reconstituted with an aged donor biome or a young donor biome. And what we did is we gave stroke at day zero. Now, I told you guys yesterday, you may not remember, but in this model, the histological infarct is complete by 24 hours. Okay, that's important because these experiments did not show any difference in infarct volume. The infarct volumes were exactly the same because we gave a stroke, we gave antibiotics on day one and two to clear the host biome, and then we gave a fecal transplant gavage um, on day three and four. And then we sacrificed these mice at 14. Okay, so all these hosts are aged. They either got a young biome or an aged biome. And you can see with a young fecal transplant, we had much better improvements in their body weight. They uh, moved a lot more in the open field. They had better cognition on the novel object and they had a decrease in depressive phenotype. And we were interested in looking depression because it's, it's common in the elderly after stroke and the vast majority of serotonin is produced in the gut. So we're kind of looking at serotonergic signal. But days after stroke, you could do this and still get a benefit. And the stroke size was exactly the same. And what is the mechanism for this? This is a busy slide, I'll just take you through it. Um, it's probably partially immune and partially metabolic. So here is a flow plot and we gated on T cells here, CD45 high, CD4 positive T cells. And what you can see is if the animals were given an aged fecal transplant, they had many fewer um, helper T cells. Whereas if this aged mouse got a young, they had an increase in these beneficial anti-inflammatory T cells. And you can see a dramatic effect even on the gut itself. So here's an animal with an aged fecal and a young fecal transplant. You can see all the mucus, you can see this nice mucus barrier, and you do not see that with the aged, um, aged biome. So we saw a difference in goblet cells, we saw a difference in gut permeability. So giving this fecal transplant really helped the gut as well as the brain. So we started saying, okay, well, what's mediating? What's the mechanisms of these effects? We know it's partially related to an increase in uh, beneficial Treg cells and a decrease in gamma delta T cells, which are detrimental. But probably doesn't matter what the bacteria are. 
What's more important is what they produce, that metabolism. So um, short chain fatty acids are end products of fermentation of dietary fibers, which has to be done by the microbiome. It's very important to maintain gut health. And we know that these short chain fatty acids are beneficial for inflammatory diseases, diabetes, gut disease, very potent anti-inflammatory effects. So we started looking at metabolome and what we found is the short chain fatty acid levels differ in the young and age biome. This is true in fecal contents, sequel contents, plasma, brain, that young biome has many more and much higher levels of acetate, propionate, butyrate, these beneficial short chain fatty acids. So is it mediated by these? And I also mentioned that it's possible that you're putting in detrimental stuff with an aged or young fecal biome. So can we refine our therapy and use bacteria therapy? So we took a group of high four bacteria that are known to be very high short chain fatty acid producers. And luckily, because other people have done this and did not find an effect, we gave them inulin. And that was kind of the difference. Inulin is a prebiotic. It's something these bacteria use as substrate, and that's really important. You have to give the bacteria, but you also have to give them something to metabolize. So we gave them um, vehicle, inulin, the short chain acid uh, producers, and then the inulin. So group D turned out to be the one that was most important. Again, these are all aged mice. And instead of giving the fecal transfer, we gave this bacterial therapy. And we found that giving this um, increase the short chain fatty acid levels in the gut, the brain, and also the plasma. So here's a heat map and you can see with vehicle, the short chain fatty acids are very, very low. But if you give these short chain fatty acid producers, short chain fatty acids go up. So they're doing something, they get through the gut. You could say, well, Louise, why don't you just give short chain fatty acids? You can't, they're too volatile, they're destroyed in the gut. So what you really wanna do for a sustained response is give the bacteria that produce the short chain fatty acids then they can ask as a little factory for these for longer term effects. Um, so clearly that worked and restoring the short chain fatty acids was enough. It, and again, no difference in infarct size, but the aged animals that got the short chain fatty acid producers and inulin had almost no neurological deficits. It was like striking. I couldn't actually believe it. Um, and it was all done blinded and randomized. So nobody knew what the groups were. And you can see they had greater strength on the hang wire. They hung longer and they had a less depressive phenotype. And you can see with the bacteria alone, we would have missed it. You have to give the inulin. So then we went back and we always try and cross translate. We went back to our biobank. We have a large biobank of stroke patients. And this is stroke patients 24 hours after stroke. They're plasma metabolomics. And you can see in controls, this heat map is now red as hot and high. And you can see this propionate, butyrate, isobutyrate are very high normally. These are stroke patients. And you can see this dramatic decrease in these short chain fatty acids 24 hours after stroke. So would it be potentially possible at 12 or 18 hours to supplement um, short chain fatty acid producers to stop this drop, this stroke induced drop in, fatty, uh, in short chain fatty acids? All right, so the proposed mechanisms for this part are really post-stroke youthful biome. We gave it to aged mice. We saw improved recovery without a difference in infarct. We saw increased short chain fatty acids. We saw increased Tregs, which are beneficial. We saw a decrease in gamma delta T cells, which are IL-17 producing, which is interesting because that pulls in neutrophils. So maybe this whole story is going to unfold that this is the reason that um, aged animals bleed, that they have more of these uh, gamma deltas that pull in um, those uh, detrimental neutrophils. And we also know there's effects on the gut. Now, also, this seems to be involved in cognition. These are germ-free mice. So these are the ones without any bio. And what we did is we took young germ-free mice, we broke germ-free, and then we replenished them either with young biome or aged biome. And you can see here, this is not a stroke model. This is just regular mice. These are the young germ-free mice and young germ-free mice who got aged biome had an anxiety phenotype. They were more immobile and that lasted 60 days. And really importantly, in a Barnes maze, they did much, much worse. So giving this aged biome has effects on cognition.
So here's just kind of a bit of a summary, and this is in that review if you're interested in gut brain access. But I wanted to spend the last bit of the talk here on looking at we talked about the age microbiome and short chain fatty acids, but there's also a really important, and we talked about this, um, I talked about it with someone yesterday, I can't remember, about indoles. Um, so tryptophan metabolites are also very important in stroke. Um, so we kind of had done a lot of this stuff on short chain fatty acids, but we also wanted to look at these uh, tryptophan metabolism. And of course, it's also involved in serotonergic signaling, which is why we were interested. And this is a classic host biome interaction. So the host, um, most of the tryptophan, the dietary tryptophan is converted 5% to serotonin, but 90% goes into this pathway. And these are host-derived metabolites. The host can metabolize tryptophan into this pathway. These are detrimental after stroke. They've been shown to be. Now, tryptophan can also be directly metabolized by the microbiota. The host can't do this. And this microbiota um, metabolism produces indoles, okay? And these are biome-derived metabolites. So you have to have bacteria to do this. We didn't know what their role was in stroke. So we decided what metabolites are, we wanted to first see, well, are these indoles really um, microbiota specific? So we went back to our germ-free models and we um, gave a wild type or a germ-free mice here. And we looked at the host-derived metabolites. This is without stroke. And you can see brain tryptophan in a, a wild type mouse, germ-free mouse, they're the same, which makes sense because those are metabolites that are produced by the host machinery. Same thing with penurin. But if you look at germ-free mice, these are completely meta, meta, uh, microbiome dependent. So you can see in the wild type brain, um, there's quite a bit of these uh, uh, indoles, but there's nothing in the germ brain because they don't have the bacteria to metabolize it. Um, so how, do the, how does the host sense these indoles, these microbial derived indoles? So there's a very important receptor called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which is very important in mucosal barriers and host uh, immune microbiome signaling. Um, it's an immune sensor. So initially AHR was discovered because of toxicology, because it's a very um, important environmental toxin. Um, and then it became very popular in immunity and cancer. Um, and may be responsible for checkpoint inhibitor benefits. And then lately, um, we've been, others too, have been looking at this as an endogenous ligand microbiome metabolomic sensor. So this, we think, is um, these AHR ligands, both, turns out, both the chimurin and the indole pathway are sensed by the AHR receptor. So we wanted to see what happened to this pathway in animals that had an age biome. So what we found is the HR ligand, the, these indol producers, the bacteria that produce indols decrease with aging. So here's young age, young age. So these things that produce these probably beneficial, especially the brucromycrabidus, um, which is actinomancia, which is one of the ones we're very interested in, decrease in aging. So we wanted to know is HR activated after stroke? Is this pathway even important? So looking at again at our human brain samples here, you can see this is AHR and this is the infarct and this is the perinfarct region. And you can see this almost like wave or gradient of AHR positivity. And where are these? Are they immune cells that are expressing this AHR? Yes, it's microglia. And we've also done this by flow. So you can see this is a normal control and there's very little activation of AHR. This is an acute stroke patient, um, and you can see in the infarct region, you can start seeing that HR increase, and it co-localizes very well with IBA1, likely microglia, and in the subacute phase, it's even more ramped up. So we think this is an important pathway in humans, and in we have to go back to our animals. So what we wanted to first see is we know that that post-derived pathway is detrimental. People have known this for a while. This penurin is bad. Um, so host-derived penurins can actually increase stroke, um, stroke damage. So can we manipulate the AHR pathway to outcompete these detrimental host-derived metabolites and put in a biome-derived metabolite? So we know that the HR ligands, the chimurin ones, the host-derived ones are bad. 
the microbiome ones are good. And we can see, con um, confirming that earlier work, after stroke, you see a big increase in brain penurin, which is bad, and a decrease in some of these indults. Um, and we think that perhaps this decrease in indults is really detrimental, and can we supplement those? So we know that after stroke, brain-derived penurins go up, and that's toxic. And we know biome-derived indults go down because the gut is damaged. So we wanted to see if we could treat um, post-stroke with indoles in germ-free mice, because again, germ-free mice don't have any indoles. So we know a direct effect of the indoles. So we gave vehicle or indole treatment three hours post-reperfusion uh, and looked at 24 hours and then flow-sorted microglia. And we see that um, there's a, um, a very dramatic activation of microglia. And you can see this AHR intensity goes up specifically in microglia. So we don't know if this is a beneficial or detrimental effect. So we looked at post-stroke deficits. We did both wild type and germ-free. And you can see here, 24 hours after stroke, treatment with these indoles decreased brain weight, suggesting less edema, um, decreased the neurological scores, and decreased uh, you know, brain volume. And this was true in both aged wild type and germ-free mice, suggesting that indoles are beneficial. We haven't quite finished this study. Um, this is, we looked at the infarct size after the injury and we're kind of finishing it, but clearly there's a trend. Here's vehicle, here's indole treatment, and you can see cortex striatal and total are all trending. The striatum was actually um, significant, but you can see a decrease in infarct volume with indole treatment. So it may be another therapy that we can uh, give to our patients. Um, now, last piece of the talk, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Pretty good. Yeah, I'm almost done. Um, is I, I'm amazed how many people don't know this. COVID is a sex specific disease. Okay. Um, are there sex differences in the response to COVID? There are similar positivity rates. So men and women get infected at the same rate. People would at first thought, well, maybe this is a gender effect. Maybe women are home and they're not getting as exposed. Nope, they get COVID at the exact same rates. But men are much more likely to require hospitalization. They're much more likely to go to the ICU and they're much more likely to die after COVID. And this holds even for correcting for risk factors like smoking, alcohol, obesity. And it's tightly associated with inflammatory markers and the cytokine storm you may see in some patients. And then what are the consequences for chronic COVID? We know that over 54% of Americans have been infected with COVID. So this is gonna be a major public health issue. So there's this great sex, gender, and COVID-19 project, and you can find this online. It's called the Global 5050. So what's the proportion of confirmed cases has died? It's double in men. So for every 10 deaths in women, there are 13 men. So 30 to 35% increased uh, risk of mortality in men. And it's seen across all age groups. So it's unlikely to be related to hormones. Although there's this interesting co-receptor um, for the ACE, for the viral enter entry that's expressed on prostate epithelium. So we chase that for a while bit more. But anyway, and, and probably looking at this data, you can see it's probably not a hormonal thing because after menopause, the same sex specific rates uh, uh, with a lower death rate in females. And this is global. This is in every country. So is it due to sex differences in inflammation? We know women are different than men. We have different chromosomes. We have different organs where our immune systems are different. So we don't reject our um, pregnancy. It's very important, immune suppression. So what we looked at is here's IL-6 and here's males. And we had mild, moderate, or severe disease males. And you can see in the severe disease, very high IL-6 in men that we didn't really see in females. This was really surprising to us. And same thing with IL-8. So males tend to have a much more robust cytokine response. And then we looked on flow-sorted fresh leukocytes. And what we found in males, so here's 
control 24, seven day, 14 days. And now we're following about a thousand COVID patients. Um, here's, and not with stroke, just COVID. Um, and controls, there's really no difference in neutrophil levels in the blood on flow cytometry. But 24 hours after COVID infection, you see an increase in the neutrophils that is sustained for two weeks after COVID. You just don't see it in females. Same thing with monocytes, which are a little slower to respond than neutrophils. You see a male specific increase in monocytes. That's innate immunity, the first responders. But interestingly, and this probably has massive consequences for long haul, which disproportionately affects women. You see controlled one day, seven days, and 14 days after COVID infection, you see a dramatic increase in B cells, adaptive immunity in women. B cells secrete antibodies. So is it possible that COVID is an autoimmune disease or is turning into an autoimmune disease in women? And is that why they have more chronic consequences from COVID? They have more PTSD, they have more anxiety. And you know, there's always this gender thing. Oh, women are more likely to go to the doctor. Or women may complain. Nope, I think it's biological. Nope, <laughs> so stop calling us blinders. Okay, conclusions. <laughs> so women are disproportionately affected by stroke but they are older at the time of the first stroke and may be ineligible for trials based on their pre-existing modified ranking. But if somebody's using a cane or a walker, they should get a thrombectomy. Like we can't exclude these patients based on age. And we have to look very carefully at how we record their pre-stroke function because otherwise we'll look like we have no benefit. You know, if we're saying, oh, they're in, they have a modified ranking of three, six months after therapy, you'll say, oh, that's not good. Well, if they were a three before, that is an amazing response. Um, neutrophils, um, especially age neutrophils, play an important role in outcome. They're rela uh, related to um, hemorrhage. We know age and stroke lead to significant dysbiosis or pathological shifts in the microbiome, altering the microbiome either before stroke or even days after stroke, three days after stroke, can enhance recovery in animal models. We also know giving a rejuvenation of the peripheral gut contents can enhance uh, cognition. Um, so this may be mediated by bacterial products, including short chain fatty acids, as well as indoles and immune changes in the host. But most importantly, you need to model the disease in the appropriate animal model, which is an aged animal. And this is very important for other diseases. Really thinking about sex as a biological factor clearly is important in other diseases. And I just use COVID as an example. And I want to acknowledge my um, lab group. It's a large group. We work well together. We have 14. We actually are just got a TBI guy. We'll be our 14th BI um, and our funding from NIH, AHA, and um, the Mission Neuroscience Institute. And that's it. Wow. Fast and furious. That's, that's, that was amazing. <laughs> We have a good time for a few questions. Sure. Um, so I'll ask anyone. I have a few, but I'll see Anish. Hi, Mr. So it was terrific. Very convincing data. The animal models replicated in humans, and that's fantastic. That's good work. Thank you. What do you think? We obviously this has significant implications of prophylactic neuroprotection and acute stroke neuroprotection. Uh, how are you planning to translate this to clinical trials? Of the yes. And the second question is a translation, and I got suspicious of myself. It strikes me that the animal models we have an added on age, which shows 40%. Yep. The humans even an end of 800. Yep. Why is that? So that's, a, brain, and yep. so that's a great point. So two questions, Bayanesh, I think I'm supposed to repeat these, right? Yes. Um, so number one is, um, are we going to bring this into clinical trial? Yes, of course, if you're going to give live bacteria, there's going to be a safety trial first, right? Because if the gut's leaking and these bacteria get out, we don't want to cause sepsis. But I think it really makes us think about our, our treatment of stroke patients. And we know there's all this big on autonomic stuff too. One of the biggest problems is post-stroke ileus. And then we're putting these dop offs and MD tubes down and giving this protein load and maybe the gut can't handle it. So I really need to look at our own data to say early feeding, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And can we, um, can we enrich 
the you know feeding uh, tube feeds or whatever, or can we get bacteria? So we are designing a small pilot trial to give the short chain fatty acid producing bacteria, but where it's in IRB now. But that's a great point that you have to really be careful about risk. And when you say, "Oh, I'm going to give a bacteria to patients," people are like, oh. and they have post stroke suppression. Now the other question was in animal models, you have an N of eight. Obviously, that's not going to happen in a clinical model where you need an N of 800. Why is that? Because they're all the same. C57 black mice. They're the same genetics, same environment, same diet. There is very little variance. And that is the value of trying to do some of these in the lab to identify targets. And then you can decide, okay, do I want to enrich my clinical trial with a specific type of patient? But there's just so much more variability in clinical populations. There's polymorphisms. And so the value of using the animal models is they're much more, um, uh, you know, the same. Um, whereas in human populations, different genetics, different genes, different diet, different risk factors. So yeah, that's the variance of people. <laughs> We have time for one last question, Natalia. Thank you, Pete. It's amazing science, and I think you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to answer the, the, the conference questions. My question is, uh, which doesn't seem to have been so far reflected in the urine model, have we investigated the effect of routine administration of medications, you know, because aging is a complex pro you know, process. We also are exposed in addition to other environmental factors to medications that, you know, with aging, there's a- And that medication list goes up and up right. and up. Yep. I mean, maybe bad, but maybe good with the purported miraculous effects of statins or something. Exactly. And that's a great point. So Natalia asked about medications, and we know as we age, the medication list gets longer, longer, longer. So there's a lot of polypharmacy, polypharmacy but we don't know how the microbiome affects some of the metabolism of these medications. And it's probably going to be very important. And this is where we have to kind of look at personalized medicine. I do think there's a lot of polypharmacy in age. I don't know if there, and um, one of the biggest risk factors that we see in age is bacterial overgrowth syndrome. And it's actually very common and it can cause ileus and malabsorption. And we know that one of the biggest complaints of our older patients is constipation. And part of that is because of ileus. And we think it's the microbiome and the metabolome is probably affecting the vagal nerve and some GI motility. So we're actually looking at that right now but it's a really unexplored field about how some of these uh, microbiome can metabolize commonly used medications. So it's important. We may think that we're giving a good dose of something and maybe we're not. So I think we'll, as metabolomics gets cheaper, I think we'll be doing way more. And that's the end product. And that's really what you want to do. Well, we could go on all day with this. Go on, man. Anybody? Uh, all day. I'd let, like to let the teams go back to rounding, but thank you, everyone who was here, and thank you again, Louise, for a fantastic talk. Oh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay. Yes.